Hey guys, welcome back to Med School Moose. This is going to be Emergency Medicine Board Exam High Yield Facts Part 3. Hopefully you've had a chance to watch Parts 1 and 2 by now. If you have not, I will put a link to that uh, playlist in the top right-hand corner right here. For most U.S.-based emergency medicine residents, the ITE, the in-training exam, is about two weeks away, so definitely watch these videos. I'm hoping to get Part 4 out before the ITE in a couple weeks, so be sure you're watching. I'm sure it'll be a good review. Same two disclaimers as always. This information is high yield for the emergency medicine ITE, the in-training exam, as well as the ABEM qualifying exam after residency. Some of this information may vary depending on what study resources you're using. If you are seeing something different in the resources you were using, I would go ahead and use that just to be consistent with your studying. With all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. First fact here, how does anserine bursitis present? This is one of those orthopedic issues that we need to know about. They may present a vignette describing the patient and you need to make the diagnosis. Anserine bursitis presents with pain located along the medial aspect of the knee about two to three inches below the joint. So if you see a patient that's having those symptoms on the exam, you want to be thinking about anserine bursitis. Next one here, what intervention has the most significant reduction in morbidity and mortality for TIA for that transient ischemic attack? This is not something that we do in emergency medicine, but it is something that we need to know. It is carotid endarterectomy, more specifically for that, for stenosis of greater than 70%. Carotid endarterectomy has the most significant reduction in morbidity and mortality for TIA. Blank is the most common presenting symptom in patients with sickle cell disease. This is acute dactylitis, that painful inflammation of the fingers. This is especially prominent in children, specifically 6 to 18 months old, so really young children. This may be one of the first symptoms they present with before the diagnosis of sickle cell disease is even made. It is acute dactylitis. What chest x-ray finding is highly suggestive of foreign body aspiration? There are a couple different things that you want to know, but the most important one I think is hyperinflation of the right lung. If you see this on the exam, if you see an image of this, this is very suggestive of a foreign body aspiration. And just as a visual stimulus, this is a picture of it. As we can see here, this right lung is very hyperinflated. It's very dark. You're not even really seeing any lung markings. If you see something like this, especially if it's a pediatric patient, you may not be able to see the foreign body, but you want to be thinking about foreign body aspiration. Next question, what is the treatment of an air gas embolism? They love these diving questions on the exam, these scuba diving questions. You are going to get something relating to this, and the treatment for an air gas embolism is hyperbaric therapy. The reason that we want to do this, it's twofold. It not only reduces the volume of bubbles, but it also allows them to re-enter solution. So any bubbles that are in the gas that are causing stroke-like symptoms or something like that, it'll make the bubbles smaller, it'll reduce the volume, but it will also allow them to re-enter solution, which should improve the patient's symptoms. According to ACOG, all RH-negative pregnant trauma patients should receive blank micrograms of anti-D immune globulin within blank hours of trauma. This is really important to know. It is 300 micrograms within 72 hours of trauma. So if you have a pregnant trauma patient that comes in from an MVC or something like that, it is 300 micrograms of that anti-D immune globulin that they need to get within 72 hours of the trauma. Very important to know both of those numbers. What is the most common location for an aortic aneurysm to rupture? Note the wording here. This is the most common location for it to rupture, not the most common location along the blood vessel itself, but within the body. And in that case, the most common location for an aortic aneurysm to rupture is in the retroperitoneal space. That is where it is most likely to occur. The important thing to note, intraperitoneal rupture is more rapidly fatal, more deadly, but retroperitoneal is more common. The uncus is part of which brain lobe? I know that this is a little bit silly, but I have seen this question in some board study material, so I think it is important to know. A lot of times in emergency medicine, we talk about uncle herniation. That's something that we really worry about, but we also want to know where the uncus is, and it is part of the temporal lobe really important to know, a little factoid that you may see on test day. Thyrotoxicosis can cause what type of heart failure? Initially, it can cause high output heart failure. This is one of the causes of high output heart failure that we need to know. Over time, it can progress to low output heart failure, but the first course of that is high output, so important to know that. What is the best modality for the diagnosis of achalasia? We probably remember this back from step one, complex level one study days, but it is esophageal manometry. Using esophageal manometry is the best to diagnose achalasia because it allows us to measure muscle strength as well as coordination of contraction 
of the lower esophagus and evaluating that lower esophageal sphincter. What is the treatment for contact dermatitis? This one is really, really important to know. It is oral prednisone tapered over two to three weeks. You may see a question asking this and it'll show you IV prednisone, it'll show you oral prednisone tapered over one to two weeks, tapered over three to four weeks. The real answer is oral prednisone tapered over two to three weeks. Really important to know all of those little details. Blank may present with Gautrin's papules. This is also something that we probably remember from step one. You guys remember that eponym Gautrin's papules that probably buried in your brain somewhere. But in this case, that is representative of dermatomyositis. That is how that presents. And another visual stimulus, this is Gotchen's papules that we see right here. The description that you may see associated with this, it's flat red papules with some central atrophy on the MCP joints. So if you see that, if you have a patient that has that, you want to be thinking of Gotchen's papules and you want to be thinking of dermatomyositis. Unidirectional nystagmus is suggestive of blank. This is important for the boards, but also really important for real life, right? When we have patients coming in with vague complaints like dizziness, we want to be able to do a good exam and be able to distinguish between really concerning and not so concerning things. In this case, unidirectional nystagmus is suggestive of peripheral vertigo. To contrast that, bidirectional nystagmus is suggestive of blank. This is going to be central vertigo and cerebellar stroke. Really, really important to know that distinction. If it's unidirectional nystagmus, we're thinking probably a peripheral cause, peripheral vertigo. If it's a bidirectional nystagmus, we're thinking a central cause, potentially a cerebellar stroke. New T-wave inversions in leads V1 to V4 can be suggestive of blank. In this case, we want to be thinking about pulmonary embolism. There are a multitude of EKG changes that can be seen with pulmonary embolism. The most common one that people talk about is S1, Q3, T3. The most common overall is actually just sinus tachycardia, so also really important to know that. But another one that we want to know, new T-wave inversions in leads V1 to V4 on an EKG, that can also be suggestive of PE. Bilateral facial nerve palsy is suggestive of blank. I encountered this question just yesterday. This is something that's really important to know. If it's bilateral facial nerve palsy or bilateral Bell's palsy, however they're describing it, we want to be thinking about Lyme disease, okay? Really important to know that one. What is the treatment of choice for many years disease? The treatment here is going to be hydrochlorothiazide, okay? Remember the triad for many years disease, it's vertigo, it's tinnitus, that ringing of the ears, and it's sensory neural hearing loss. The reason that we're using hydrochlorothiazide is it because it can promote excretion of inner ear fluid and that may improve the symptoms. Other diuretics can be used as well, but the most common one that I've seen is hydrochlorothiazide. What is the most common infectious cause of aplastic crisis in patients with sickle cell disease? This is going to be parvovirus B19. Remember, the two really important things we want to know with parvovirus, of course, it causes that erythema infectiosum, that slap cheek disease in children, but it can also cause aplastic crisis in our sickle cell disease patients. Really important to know those two different facts. How can the incidence of non-hemolytic febrile transfusion reactions be reduced? This one's pretty simple. You just want to use leukocyte reduced or WBC reduced red blood cell transfusions. That can give you a lower incidence of those non-hemolytic febrile transfusion reactions. What is the management of uncomplicated rectal prolapse? We probably all know this one because it's one of those cool factoids within emergency medicine. It's going to be manual reduction if it's uncomplicated. Specifically, you can use granulated sugar that'll kind of help reabsorb the water and can help reduce the swelling of the tissue. And that's how you can manage rectal prolapse. The other important thing to know, of course, if it is complicated, we do not want to do manual reduction. The management of complicated rectal prolapse would be surgery. A fast exam is most sensitive in detecting what volume of free fluid. This is going to be greater than 200 milliliters. We do the fast exam all the time. If there's a large volume of fluid, specifically greater than 200 milliliters, that is very sensitive, okay? Uh, but if it's less than that, it can be a little bit less sensitive. So really want to know that distinguishing number. Why are patients with Crohn's disease at an increased risk for nephrolithiasis. This is because of increased serum oxalate due to poor levels of excretion. Oxalate is typically excreted in the terminal ileum within the GI tract. Of course, patients with Crohn's disease have inflammation irritation of that, so they are not excreting oxalate as much. It is increasing in the serum and that can precipitate as kidney stones. What are the teratogenic effects of doxycycline? Do not get tripped up by this one. There are no teratogenic effects of doxycycline. 
For that reason, it can be used safely in pregnancy to treat conditions like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Really important to know that. You're going to be worried because it's a baby and it's tetracyclines, but in terms of teratogenic effects, it is safe in pregnancy, so you would want to use it to treat pregnant patients that have those conditions. At what HCG level can an intrauterine pregnancy be visualized on transvaginal ultrasound? The number may vary a little bit, but it's typically 1,500 milli-international units per milliliter. It can be up to about 2,000 some have a range of 1500 to 2000 but the lower limit of that that i want you to know is 1500 at what age does patent ductus arteriosus typically present this presents at about two months of life okay remember patent ductus arteriosus as the pulmonary pressure decreases blood will flow from the aorta back into the right ventricle this occurs at about two months and then the, the baby will start to have symptoms of chf pulmonary hypertension, that kind of thing, and that's occurring at about two months of age. What is the etiology of a spagelian hernia? There are uh, several different types of hernias that we need to know. This is one of the less common ones, but of course, that's why they love to ask about it on the boards. The cause of a spagelian hernia is the absence of the posterior rectus sheath, and because this sheath is not present, the bowel can become incarcerated between the two muscle layers, and that is what causes a spagelian hernia. Getting back to basics a little bit here, what is the classification of Klebsiella? I know some of these these questions might seem silly, might seem like they're step one, not really relevant for emergency medicine. The only reason I'm including them on here is because I have seen them in emergency medicine board exam preparation material. So silly things like this, we do need to know. Klebsiella, it is a gram-negative bacillus. I just want you guys to see this just in case you get a question having to do with that on the boards. You should hopefully be able to identify it and not get silly questions wrong and lose points. How long must symptoms of excessive anxiety and worry persist to diagnose generalized anxiety? disorder. This is going to be at least six months, and this is the case for most uh, psychiatric illnesses as well as most illnesses, like designating them acute compared to chronic. It's usually six months or less is acute, and then greater than six months is chronic. In this case, six months or less is excessive anxiety and worry, but greater than six months, you can actually diagnose generalized anxiety disorder. Splenic sequestration occurs blank autosplenectomy. In this case, it's before. Splenic sequestration occurs before autosplenectomy. What is chillblains? I think this is the last one that we have here. This is painful inflammation of small blood vessels in the skin due to exposure to cold but not freezing air. Chillblains, it's a really important one to know. The other name for it is pernio, P-E-R-N-I-O. So either of those, it's kind of like a small vessel vasculitis. It can also cause some itchiness and it can cause some blistering. Just one last visual stimulus here. This is chillblains. We see some of the, the redness, that painful inflammation uh, in these small blood vessels. So I really want you to know what that is as well. That is the end of this video. Hopefully you got some useful information out of this. As always, please like, comment, subscribe. If you have any suggestions for future videos or things that I could be doing better, let me know because I want to make sure that I'm giving you guys the highest quality education material as I can. As always, thank you so much for watching. Good luck on the ITE exam that is coming up in just a couple weeks and good luck studying.